Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, audiophiles and music lovers. Today we'll be reviewing the Audio Research Reference 160M Mark II Monoblock Power Amplifiers. I hope you enjoy it. Audio Research, as some of you will know, is a historic company in the high-end audio field. In the late 60s and particularly in the 1970s, they kind of brought the tube amplification circuit in both power amps and preamps back into the high-end and in the consideration set of people looking for the best possible equipment. Uh, it really hadn't taken very long, but solid state transistors were increasingly viewed as the state-of-the-art device and with technological determinism being what it is, uh, everybody kind of assumed tubes were done. Uh, William Z. Johnson, who was the founder and president of Audio Research, did a lot of substantial work on the refinement of tube circuits and pretty clearly demonstrated to people in particular, uh, the reviewers at the Absolute Sound, that tube circuits were indeed not only not dead, but were maybe the next big thing. Anyway, here we are 50 years later, and uh, we're looking at an audio research product. It's a fully tube amplifier, and we're trying to consider whether or not this is still a big thing. I'll be back in a minute to tell you about the circuitry and then we'll get down to sound quality. The Audio Research Reference 160M Mark II, which is a mouthful, is a mono power amp, so you need two of these amplifiers. They are each priced at $19,000, so it's $38,000 for a pair of these. We'll try to keep in the context of these, this discussion that these are not inexpensive amplifiers, although in today's world, they're also far from the most expensive amplifiers. At any rate, the 160Ms are 140 watt per channel rated power into four, eight, or 16 ohms. As with many tube amplifiers, there are output taps on the back to match the impedance of the speaker with the output impedance of the amplifier. So if you have four ohm speakers, you hook up to the four ohm taps. If you have eight ohm speakers, you hook up to the eight ohm taps. Okay, so you've got 140 watt per channel tube amplifier. Each amp weighs 62 pounds, so they're uh, pretty substantial, although you know there are lots of bigger, heavier amplifiers than these. They use KT150 output tubes. They have a beautiful metering system on the front that allows you to keep track of how much power you're using, or you can turn them off, turn the lights off if you like listening in the dark. They can be operated in ultra-linear mode, which is what I primarily used, uh, and that gives you the full 140 watts of output power, or they can be run in triode mode, which gives you about half the power. I think they say 75 watts per channel is the output in triode mode. Uh, some people love the sound of triodes, and if you have very efficient speakers, that might be an interesting way to go. I'll comment at the end about how I thought the triode mode sounded, but I have moderate efficiency speakers, 87 dB at one meter is the measurement of the Magico A5s that I used. So I primarily used ultra-linear mode, and I like a good deal of bandwidth. Interestingly enough, I'll just comment on this now because it's not super germane, but it might be interesting. The about 50% marking on the output meters is 1.5 watts. And I would say when the sound in my listening room was pretty loud with these speakers, uh, that's kind of the power level that I tended to be operating around, 1.5 watts. We've made this point before. 
Your general average power level is actually quite low, but you want to be able to have big voltage and current swings when the dynamics of the music ramp up. And uh, I'll talk about the dynamics in a bit, but I thought the combination worked quite well with speakers of this efficiency level. The other things I'll say about the amplifiers are there are quite a few settings on the back that allow you to control uh, the power on operation and other parameters of the amplifier. You can see those in our pictures of the back of the amplifier. So there's quite a bit of flexibility built in here, including the ability to do remote turn on and those kinds of things. The amplifier also takes into real consideration the fact that when you're turning an amplifier on, it can, uh, during the warm up process, make some noises. So there's a two minute muting period. Audio research is also very clear that you should uh, turn the power amps on last and turn them off first to limit the amplifier's ability to reproduce other source turn on transients. That again is not uncommon. They're just, I thought they were super clear about what you needed to do. Okay, let's get down to sound quality because that's really why we're here. All right, you know, some days you just wake up and you feel right with the world and it's going to be a good day. Well, that's kind of the feeling I had once I got these amps fired up. I was a little bit hesitant about a tube amplifier with moderate efficiency speakers playing all kinds of music that I enjoy and like to use for my testing. So I went in with a little bit of trepidation to listening to the Audio Research Reference 160M Mark IIs. I shouldn't have been so hesitant. Audio Research has a history, as I pointed out at the beginning, and that history, I think, is really on display with these amplifiers. Tube circuits have been around for a long time. We're not gonna do anything like gigantically new, I would guess. Uh, I'm not a circuit designer, so I can't 100% tell you that, but I'm guessing that this is the product of decades of refinement and part selection and learning what matters and what doesn't matter. But anyway, something went down with this amplifier that just makes it I'm going to say the word, which I don't really love to say, but it's kind of magical. Let me try to describe that magic for you, though, in some fairly clear terms. The first thing I noticed was this amplifier has a magical combination of qualities that usually don't go together. There are lots of power amps that are great at X, but there's always the sense that we gave up a little something, or they're great at Y, but we gave up something else. There are trade-offs in life. That's just, generally speaking, engineering reality. At any rate, let me talk about the qualities that the 160M Mark II puts together that I have essentially never heard come together like this. All right, number one, the first thing they do that just stood out was they combine mid-range and treble clarity with an absolutely gorgeous tone color. And I bring that out because A, it was the thing that most hit me right off the bat. And secondly, because when I say gorgeous tone color, you tend to think of coloration, but I'm talking about clarity and accuracy and detail in mid-range and high frequency sounds and yet the instrument sounded beautiful and not messed up or adulterated with those little really unaudible and yet you can hear them uh, you just don't hear them explicitly distortions that make you aware that you're listening to hi-fi equipment you're not listening to real music. In the case of the 160M Mark II, we're talking about the ability to do the, the naturalness and the feel and the tonality of 
each instrument without any of that other stuff together with just a laser focused ability to bring out the overtones in the music and all of the details, but without them attacking you. This is just a combination you don't always hear. There are uh, some great uh, uh, power amps and preamps that I've heard from Japan that do this naturalness unlike anything else, but they often sound just a little bit rounded or uh, muted or reserved in their presentation. And that just wasn't the case with the 160M Mark IIs. They really put this combination of mid-range and treble clarity together with beautiful tone color and naturalness in a way that I just can't say I've heard from any other amplifier. I want to bring out another element of the combination of tone color, beautiful tone color, with uh, another factor that I think often doesn't go along for the ride. And that is that the treble doesn't feel rolled off. It feels super extended. Uh, it Almost the opposite of rolled off. I don't mean it's bright, but it just feels like it goes out and out and out. And that combination of qualities is uh, really great on classical music, of course, but you also notice it on acoustic recordings, jazz or rock or pop or uh, chamber music for that matter, where you can sense the hall sound and that extended feeling brings out the airiness of the hall in just a wonderful way that really adds to the sense of realism in the whole presentation of the 160M Mark II. Now, for the third factor that I really liked and was a combination of things that often don't go together, the delivery of tonal density. I'm not talking about tone color here. I'm talking about the sense that music, especially ensembles, this could be symphony orchestras, of course, where you often have 100 people playing or more, playing together at the same time. Sure, that's possible, but it's also true with a lot of rock where there's just dense orchestration going on and a significant production with uh, strings and various percussion instruments and multiple keyboards and multiple singers. You've got a lot going on in a lot of rock and pop recordings. And in that case, you have the need for the sense of tonal density. That is to bring all of that richness to the fore, but not turn it into a blob of slush, but keep each instrument or each voice separated out and yet have the tone feel rich and multivariate. And the 160M Mark II really delivers that without being uh, heavy or sludgy, which we often get this sense of tonal density by shifting the balance a little bit to the low end, but the 160M doesn't really do it that way. It just reveals what's happening in tonality. So it's almost like the concept that we've talked about in many of our videos, which is uh, instrumental or performer spotlighting. You want to really be able to hear the line that a performer is playing separated from a line that another performer is playing. It's almost like the 160M takes that concept and then brings it up a notch to the level of saying, ah, yeah, you want that. And then you want the tonality of each of the instruments that each of the performers is playing to stand out in a rich and clear way. So that ability to do natural tonal density with delicacy, not heaviness, is, I think, a major achievement of this amplifier. Just a brief interruption, esteemed viewers. As you may know, I'm Tom Martin, Chief Content Officer of The Absolute Sound. We have a new product. It's on the Substack platform, and we're going to do some interesting things with Substack. First of which is reader questions and answers. 
Each Monday, readers will submit questions, we'll pick the most interesting ones, and we'll answer the questions on Friday. We'll also have early access to articles and special blogs that don't appear anywhere else. We hope you'll join us. It's only a cost of a cup of coffee per month. Just check on the screen or in the show notes below. Thanks. And now back to the show. The fourth thing that I want to talk about with uh, Reference 160 M Mark II is base definition. Uh, You know, we all have our views on what technology leads to what kind of sound quality. And, you know, I, I... you try as a reviewer to erase all those thoughts from your head, but inevitably you have them. I have a sense that tube power amplifiers often sound rich, but the bass isn't as detailed as it could be. In this case, though, I want to say, again, the fourth thing that the Reference 160M Mark IIs put down that are unusual combinations is uh, bass weight, combined with excellent bass definition. Now, I'm saying that a little bit in the context of this is a tube amplifier, yes. There are solid-state amplifiers that kind of specialize in this thing. And yet, I want to come back to this idea of tone color and tonal beauty that is kind of the theme throughout this whole thing, which is that bass instruments on the 160M Mark II just sound kind of right and musical and beautiful in a way that combines this sense of weight with detail in a way that is, I think, kind of unusual and to me stood out a little bit from what some of the better solid state amplifiers do. So here's another win for the Reference 160M. Final standout characteristic in terms of sound quality with uh, 160M Mark II. There is a dynamic capability here that doesn't reach out and grab you by the neck. It doesn't, you know, get a hold of you. And yet it's a wonderful thing once you realize it's what's going on. And that's that the dynamics sound natural. They don't sound Uh, overly jumpy and they don't sound uh, passive or wimpy softness in the dynamic realm. Nope, they sound right and they sound natural but the standout thing I think, the dynamic excellence is partially based on not having the instrumental separation change as the dynamics go up and down you realize that it's a little bit like wow and flutter on a turntable or instability in turntable speed or other things where there's some timing variation of the quality of the presentation. You realize with the 160M Mark IIs that kind of high dynamic, low dynamic, uh, high average sound level, peaks and valleys, the Uh, the instrumental separation, the imaging, there's not collapsing and crushing together of things. Things are just kind of presented the same way they would be on stage, which is, you know, when Stevie Ray cranks up the Telecaster, it sounds like the Telecaster still on stage through his amplifier. I forget what he used, but whatever amp Stevie Ray used, you know, it just, it, it didn't sound like the musician changed position. It didn't sound like he was using a different amp. It, it sounded like it sounded. And that ability to not have things shift around is a subtle subconscious thing that, again, triggers you to think you're listening to stereo, not to the real thing. And I thought that was a, a big achievement of these amplifiers. Now, I just have to note that this is a 140 watt power amplifier, 140 watts per channel, because you're going to have two of these. But you can't drive every possible amplifier with this in every possible room. Uh, So I just want to note my general sense of this is this is a really good amplifier to use 
up to maybe 3,000 cubic feet of listening room space. That'll cover a lot of people. It's also a really good choice with relatively high efficiency speakers. I would say the Magicos that I'm using and other speakers in this range that are 87, 88 dB will work for people in a lot of medium size rooms, maybe even in larger rooms if you have a setup where the listening triangle is actually relatively compact, which is what you almost certainly should be doing, but not everyone is. Um, or you might be using some of the really efficient Wilsons, as an example, speakers that are in the 92, 93 dB efficiency realm. And I think then these amplifiers would work in a significantly larger room. I happen to have the chance to hear the predecessor of uh, this amplifier driving uh, Wilson LXVs. It's a very nice speaker in a huge room at Expona. And uh, they sounded great. Uh, one of the best sounds I've heard at a show in many, many years. So uh, you can use something like a Wilson in a pretty large room and you can get away with it. So I wouldn't be super concerned about this, but this is not the uh, amplifier for 82 dB efficient speakers in a large room where you tend to listen at high levels or to super dynamic music. Uh, you know, almost every amplifier has some kind of limitation like that. Uh, so you want to be thinking with each power amplifier about how you match its output to your particular conditions. But anyway, I just wanted to throw that caveat out there because it's an obvious and important one. All right, let's summarize the Audio Research Reference 160M Mark IIs. I found these to be outstanding amplifiers. Yes, they're expensive. And I think I'd like to put that in the context of as you go up the price curve, you tend to get refinements that for some people are determinatively excellent and important and for other people are super subtle and irrelevant. I'm not going to make that judgment for you. However, in the context of the basic value test, show me better for less, I don't think you can show me better for less, but maybe you could. I have, I'm have. i far from having heard all amplifiers, so you know, I stand to be corrected there. But I think this is an amplifier that is well worth its price tag for people who really appreciate what it does. Let's summarize what it does. First of all, beautiful tonality. That's thing number one. Thing number two is tonal density. Thing number three is a natural bass weight with high definition and then excellent dynamics, particularly in terms of how dynamic swings affect sound staging and how dynamic swings affect instrumental separation. So those are some qualities that stood out for me. But when you break it down analytically like that, which is, you know, a good thing to do for communication purposes. But when you break it down like that, the problem is something I feel like gets lost a little bit in the mix. And this is just an amplifier that sucks you into the music and gets you to enjoying it and listening to track after track after track. And in some ways, that's really the ultimate test of some kind of anti-realism veil has been lifted and we're getting closer to the music and we're more able to enjoy the music. And as I said, that's what we're here for. I hope you've enjoyed this review. Uh, I hope you will come back. To come back, please click on the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, look in the show notes or on screen for the URL where you can get our weekly newsletter. And of course, we've been doing it for 50 years. We'd love it if you would join us by subscribing to the Absolute Sound magazine. Thanks for being here, and we hope you'll join us next time.
Ladies and gentlemen, just a brief coda, as I promised, on the differences I hear between triode and ultralinear mode with audio research 160M Mark II. Uh, this is not going to be a blinding insight for those of you who are accustomed to this kind of switching capability, but uh, I would say in summary that the triode mode has, with the speakers I used, which are relatively low impedance forum speakers and not super efficient, and the results could certainly change with different speaker systems. But triode mode, in my experience, had a couple of characteristic elements. It sounded a little more focused. Uh, triode mode sounded a little bit smaller and it sounded more rounded. And by rounded, I mean maybe a teensy bit rolled off in the treble and in the bass. I felt like the dynamics were mm, just slightly more reserved. And there were times, particularly on female vocals, when I thought the tonal qualities that I talked about before with ultralinear mode were in some ways maybe even more beautiful. Was that an artifact uh, or is that uh, triode mode singing out or is it the fact that probably things like the output impedance of the amp changes a little bit and that changes frequency response and uh, that's complementary with certain recordings and not with other recordings. That I don't know. Um, I would say overall that I preferred ultralinear mode with this kind of speaker system. I really enjoyed the big sound, the instrumental separation, and as I said before, I still thought the tonal quality in ultralinear mode was outstanding, but I could imagine situations, rooms or room speaker combinations where triode might be, triode mode might be advantageous. And uh, I felt a little bit with these speakers, like triode mode was, uh, you couldn't hear it per se, but it looked like we might be getting closer to the limits of the amplifier's output capability, but with significantly more efficient speakers. I mean, going from 87 to 93 is not a giant leap in efficiency. And with that, the triode mode would be more powerful than what I heard with ultralinear mode, not in raw wattage, but in effective output capability. Uh, and with certain speaker systems, as I said, and certain speaker room combinations, that rounded characteristic of triodes and the focus sound might be something that you would find really desirable. I don't see any drawback to having this built into the amp. You've got the choice. You can even, you know, adjust according to the music you're listening to. That said, I want to be clear, if I were using speakers like this and had the sonic signature that I'm accustomed to, uh, it would be Ultra linear all the time for me, but I love choices and I think you would enjoy it too. <laughs>